This procedure demonstrates the internal components for the 2510 series valve. This is the teardown procedure for the 2510 valve. On this side, we have our electromechanical time clock unit. On this side, we have our SXT electronic controller. As we rotate the units to the side, we can see that from the back plate to the rear, the valves are built identically. Our mechanical unit shows the square block on the back, which is our rare no hard water bypass option for commercial applications. We're going to use our electronic version as our focus because it uses a standard piston. To begin with, we can remove our controller cover. With the SXT, we press in on the tab and pull it forward. This gives us access to our circuit board. We pull to the side and rotate the circuit board out. Once this is free, we can pull the cables loose from the bottom. The cable on this side is our incoming power, our motor power, and our limit switches. We pull down on this in order to free it from the connectors. You may have to pull up on some of the tabs in order to free the connections. If your unit is metered, you'll have a meter connection here with three pins. We again pull that down in order to remove it from the circuit card. The circuit card is now free from the unit. If we need to remove the rest of the controller, we open the door and tuck the wires through. To remove the bracket, we remove these two screws from the back plate. On the opposite side of the assembly, we have the J-tube that goes between our injector assembly and our brine valve. We loosen the nuts and pull the J-tube towards the rear of the unit. We can now remove that and put it to the side. Make note there are different lengths for the standard applications and the no hard water bypass units. On the top of the unit, we have our injector assembly. Make note that a number will be stamped into the top, telling you which injector number is inside the housing. We can remove the two screws that hold this down to the body of the valve. Once we have this loose, we can see the screen assembly and our two-piece injector. The screen assembly pulls loose from the body. The water flows through the screen before it goes into the injector so we need to make sure that there is no debris built up on it or any damage. We would need to replace it if there is damage or debris that cannot be cleaned. We then have access to the top part of our injector. This system uses our 1600 injector system which uses two parts. The top part can be removed and we can check for any debris or buildup in it. We can then use a smaller slotted screwdriver to go inside the body and get the second part of the injector. Once that is loose, we also can check it for any debris or buildup in there. There are different materials, different colors, and different sizes of injectors available in the 1600 system. If you need to replace the components, you want to make sure you match the color and material for the correct size of tank and pressure that the unit is operating at. We can now move over to our brine valve, which is located on the side here. There's a nut that holds this to the back plate. We loosen the nut and can remove the brine valve. This particular brine valve is a brass version. We want to make sure that the brine line flow control, which on this unit is one gallon per minute, matches with what we replace it with. Make note, the tag will tell you what the refill flow control is. We want to make sure we match this up with our injector size. You may also find plastic versions that also have the different flow controls in them. You can match a plastic with the same brine line flow control with a brass and retrofit the two out. 
We can now move to our drain line flow control. To remove the drain line flow control, we pull the clip up and the connection loose from the body. The smaller size units will be in the plastic size. This particular unit is a 2.4 gallon per minute unit. Higher flows are available in the brass size, such as this 3.5 gallon per minute unit. If you need a higher flow, we do have clip-in connectors that do not have any flow control inside them, so you can use a remote or larger flow control. We can now move to the wiring on the front of the unit. We have a connection for the motor, which is on this unit is our two blue lines. This pulls apart if we need to replace our motor. We then move over to our two limit switches. We want to make note that the inside or closer to the motor connection is our homing switch before we remove them so we know when we reassemble them the red does go closer to the motor. Once these are removed we have access to the ground screw. This gives us good access to our drive link that holds the drive assembly to our piston. For difficult to remove units, you will loosen the screws and use the drive assembly to pull the piston out. More often than not, you can just pull the drive link loose here. You grab the drive link pin from the side and pull over. We can now remove the two screws that hold the motor and the back plate to the valve. Using a large slotted screwdriver or the appropriate nut driver, we will unthread the back plate from the valve. The drive motor is now free, as is our back plate. Moving over to the valve, we can see that there is a clamp that holds the top of the body down to the base of the valve. You'll note that the word top is on here for orientation when we reassemble the unit. To the rear we have a screw that we can use either a slotted or a Phillips screwdriver in order to loosen it. Once the screw is loose, we pull in on the crimp and move the screw to the side. We can then remove it from the valve. Once that is loose, the top of the valve can be removed from the base plate. The base plate has an O-ring type seal that goes around the different orifices. If you have a leak between the base plate and the valve, we recommend replacing this. With the valve removed, it makes it easier for you to remove the piston and seals and spacers without any fear of any spacers or seals coming through the valve. We pull up on both the piston rod and the top cap. If necessary, you can use the pin from the drive link in order to help give you some leverage or any other piece of straight wire. Once the unit is out, we can check the O-ring to make sure there is no damage to it if there is a leak past the end cap. The end cap should never be moved past the gray Teflon coating. If it is moved into the raw steel area, it will damage the quad ring that is in the end cap. If your end cap comes off of the end, you will want to replace the piston as a whole assembly. We now have access to the seals and spacers inside the valve. Some of the seals and spacers at the end can be removed with your fingers. But as you get further in, it is necessary to use tools in order to help get them out. For the spacers, we have a tool that we press in, press on the top, and it pulls the spacers out. As we press in, the teeth come forward in order to go into the openings in the spacer. For the seals, we have a hook tool that makes it easier to get into the body to pull them out. We repeat this as we go further and further into the valve, alternating our tools to get the different components out. Once all of the standard seals and spacers are removed, we come to the very end. 
The 2510 uses a special end cap. Make note when you are putting these back in, one side has a ridge which is designed to cut into the seal. The other end is tapered. The body is now free and clear of all of its components, so we can begin the reassembly process. To begin rebuilding the valve, we need three items. A stuffer tool, a new set of seals and spacers, and the appropriate silicone lubricant. We start with the white unit, which is the first to go in. Making note that the tapered end goes to the rear of the unit, and the side that has a raised ridge goes to the top. We then take our first seal and apply some lubricant. We place this in the top of the tool, tucking it in. We flip the tool and seat it into the valve. We now alternate between seals and spacers for the remainder of the valve. Once we have put the last spacer and seal assembly in, make note that the seals and spacers will sit below the front edge by about a half an inch. This makes room for our cap on the piston assembly so that the o-ring can seal inside the opening. To put in our piston, we bring back our lubricant to the o-ring. Applying a small amount, we can now place the piston into our assembly. Make note that the end cap will sit proud of the front of the valve by a small amount, approximately a sixteenth of an inch. When the power head is tensioned, it will press this flush with the body. The rest of the procedure is the reverse of removal. Good luck and thanks for watching.